today is Pentecost Sunday, the celebration of God sending His Spirit to be with all His people for His purposes in the world. It's also the final in our series on the genesis of work. And today I want to explore what it means for us to live as witnesses, as Jesus said that His followers would do when they receive His Spirit, particularly thinking about being a witness in connection with our work. John Dixon tells a story about an American Airlines pilot's attempt to be a witness in his workplace. This pilot had just returned from a short-term mission trip to Costa Rica. And coming back to work, he had what he thought was a, a great idea for being a witness in, in his actual job. And so on one flight, shortly after the plane had taken off, and he'd introduced himself as the captain of the plane over the PA, he said this to the whole plane. He said, ladies and gentlemen, would all the Christians on board today please identify themselves by raising their hands? He then went on to urge the other passengers to take the opportunity during this four hour flight to discuss Christianity with those who had raised their hands saying it was crazy not to believe in Jesus. The result, as you might have guessed, was not as he had probably hoped. Uh, he, he, this flight was a few years after what had happened in 9-11, and several of the passengers started to try to call relatives, hearing the captain's announcement as a veiled warning that you have to convert to Christianity because I'm in charge of this plane and you might not make it home tonight. I'm not sure how you feel about this story and this Christian's attempt to witness in his workplace. What do you think you would have done if you'd found yourself on that plane being asked to raise your hand so that others could discuss your faith with them? How would you have reacted to this invitation if you did not know Jesus? I think this story raises questions for us about what it means for us to be witnesses to Jesus. Because I think we all want to be witnesses in our workplace, but maybe we don't know what that means or how to be it. In Acts 1.8, before he ascends as king to the place of his reign, Jesus says to his disciples, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And what happens just after this is the disciples do receive the Spirit. They begin to speak in other languages and Peter gets up to explain what's happening as one of these witnesses to who Jesus is. I want to explore what is happening here and what it means for these apostles to be called by Jesus as witnesses. And then to think about what it might mean for us to be a witness in our context. Because these apostles aren't actually the first people who are called witnesses in the Bible. And the way that this word is used throughout scripture, I think is instructive for what Jesus is calling them and us to do. We use the word witness in our English language, primarily in a legal sense, to, to speak of, first of all, someone who's seen something, and in a deeper sense, someone who's not only seen something, but is also willing to vouch for what they've seen. They're willing to put up their hand and say they've seen it, and then act in light of what they've witnessed. We have witnesses in signing a legal document, for example where a witness says that they've seen the person who has signed it and it really is this person. They'll vouch for, for that fact. Or if you see a car accident, for example, you are a witness to that event. But then you may or may not stand as a witness, depending on whether or not you're willing to testify about what you saw happen. The word witness is also used throughout the Bible in a similar way, but in a more relational sense, as well as a legal one at times. It indicates witnessing an agreement taking place, like a commitment between people or between God and people, as well as a willingness to testify 
about what a person has seen or experienced. Much of the Old Testament narrative outlines the ways in which God has chosen Israel as his witnesses and the ways in which they fail in this role. God always acts first to show Israel who he is and only then he asks them into a covenant agreement with him, which they become witnesses of. And he wants them to live in this covenant agreement so that they will then stand as witnesses of who he is to the other nations. The central example of this is at Mount Sinai, after God has rescued Israel from slavery in Egypt and led them through the sea toward the promised land, they've seen who he is. They've seen what he can do. And Moses meets with God on Sinai. And while the word witness isn't used here, we see how God intends for Israel to be his witnesses to the world in Exodus 19. Israel encamped before the mountain while Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him out of the mountain saying, thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the people of Israel, you yourselves have seen, you've witnessed what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests, that is, those who represent me to the rest of the world, and a holy nation. God is saying, because of what you've seen and experienced me do for you, I want you now to live as my witnesses to everyone else. Israel is God's chosen witness, and yet the Old Testament story shows how this nation fail as witnesses to the promise that they've made before God and they fail as witnesses to who God has shown himself to be in their midst. This idea of Israel as God's witness is developed through the book of Isaiah particularly and in a deeper way. Isaiah himself witnesses who God is as king at the beginning of the book and then as are most of the Old Testament prophets, Isaiah is a witness that stands to testify against Israel. Isaiah articulates God's intention for Israel, his servant, but their unwillingness to witness to what they've seen and heard of God. And much of this book unpacks the ways in which Israel become witness of their own unfaithfulness to God. Here's Eugene Peterson's version of Isaiah 42. God says to Israel, pay attention. Are you deaf? Open your eyes. Are you blind? You're my servant and you're not looking. You're my messenger and you're not listening. The very people I depended upon, servants of God, blind as a bat, willfully blind. You've seen a lot, but looked at nothing. You've heard everything, but listened to nothing. But then in Isaiah's servant songs, God provides a solution to their inability to witness to who he is. And God says that he will raise up a servant figure who will enable Israel to witness faithfully to God. Isaiah says in chapters 52, 13 to 53, 12, that the suffering and death of this servant is the means by which both Israel and the nations would come to the light of God's truth. They will witness the servant's work and testify to his accomplishment. As a result of what they see God do through this servant, Israel would then take on the role of a witness to the nations in the sense that the way that they live will cause the nations to inquire after God, which has really been their assignment all along, but they've been unable to carry it out. And so at the arrival of Jesus, we see the arrival of this servant figure from Isaiah. This is what the gospel writer says about John the Baptist in John chapter 1, verse 7. He, they, he says, John the Baptist came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. 
And then in verse 29, we read, The next day John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is referencing that servant in Isaiah 52 and 53. This is who, he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the spirit descend from heaven like a dove and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the son of God. And then in his ministry, Jesus himself bears witness to himself as this servant king sent by God. In John chapter 8, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. This is what God had told Israel in Isaiah 42 and 49, that they were supposed to be as his witnesses. Whoever follows me, Jesus says, will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisees said to him, you are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Jesus answered, even if I do not do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I came from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from or where I am going. And then again, When Jesus is before Pilate being sentenced to death in chapter 18, Pilate says to Jesus, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And so Jesus is killed as this suffering servant from Isaiah, claiming to be king, and rises again from the dead as proof of king. And when he is risen from the dead, he says to his followers, you are witness of who I am and of what has happened in my suffering and my resurrection. And then for us today, When we experience the power and the love of the risen Jesus, we receive his spirit like those first followers. And the spirit bears witness to us about who Jesus is. And our eyes are open to who he is, which enables us to join that long line of God's people throughout history who bear witness to Jesus as their Lord. The way to be a witness to Jesus, I think, is less about trying to witness to him and more about being formed by his spirit into people who can represent him well in whatever context we're in. The work of witness is about being. It's something that we are before it's about doing something. When we first remember that we are witnesses, if we've come to see who Jesus is, then we can cooperate with him for all our work and our rest to act as a testimony of this, to bear witness to him in ways that are helpful and that are not misrepresentations of him. The two ways in our work that we bear witness to Jesus is through our words and our actions, and they go together as one. So first in words, a witness explains what they've seen of Jesus and why that's good news. This is What happens in Peter's speech when when they're there at that first Pentecost, when the Spirit is poured out? He starts explaining to these Jews who are in Jerusalem from all over the world. First, by looking at what's happening at Pentecost there based on the Old Testament expectations from the prophet Joel. And then he tells them about who this Jesus was about his life, about his death, his resurrection and his ascension, and how he is the anticipated king from the line of David that they had hoped for from their scriptures. And then he names the apostles as witnesses of Jesus' resurrection in Acts 2.32. 
This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this, that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. He's made you witnesses of this fact, he's saying. And then here's the point of the good news that he's telling them. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. The point he's making is that Jesus is Lord and Christ in a way that makes sense to them from their scriptures. And so in light of that, the people's response to this makes sense. When they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what do we do? They're going, we crucified him, but he was the king. And Peter said to them, repent. In other words, say you were wrong in what you used to think about him and show that you've changed your mind. Repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is given to everyone who turns their life in allegiance to Jesus as King in order to be his witnesses. That's what the Spirit's for. Some of us will do this as evangelists, literally good newsers, who carry this desire to share and have clarity in telling others about who Jesus is. But for many of us, this will simply be the willingness to explain to others who we think Jesus is, how we've met him, and why that's good news to us, why that's good news to you specifically. In one sense, that American Airlines pilot's passion for thinking of ways of sharing the gospel is something to be commended. He was bold in that, wasn't he? But in other ways, it was also very unhelpful in the context that he was in and in the way that he approached it. He threw his Christian brothers and sisters into the firing line while he sat comfortably up in the cockpit of the plane. And he, he didn't think about the context that he was in and what people needed from him in that place, which was to provide a place of safety for his passengers and comfort for them and to serve them as he flew them to their destination. First then, a witness can explain who Jesus is and why that's good news. And then secondly, that goes together with it, a witness's life demonstrates to others what Jesus cares about. This is the very thing that the Old Testament prophets stood as witness against Israel about. They pointed out the fact that Israel's words and their religious ceremonies may have confessed knowing God. They might have been able to explain the good news of who God is and his character, but their lives, their everyday work betrayed him. They didn't live the character that God was. They didn't live for the justice and treatment of others that God cares so deeply about. The early church, on the other hand, grew precisely because people's whole lives were reordered around Jesus as their king. The way they treated the poor and marginalized, the way that women were brought into a rightful place in society. These became central distinguishing features of their community and their work. People saw the everyday conduct of Christians and became intrigued by it because they were different. People's lives are changed as they meet Jesus through the early church and others come to see that a life ordered with Jesus as Lord is far better than one ordered by the Roman emperor. The whole point of this series that we've been going through over the past few months has been to help us to think about how knowing Jesus affects every area of our lives, especially our work because this is what we do with most of our time. Our work is a primary place of witness. Not the only place, but it is the integration of our, our discipleship into our work 
that will best show the people we work with who God is and what he cares about. The 20th century playwright and poet and novelist Dorothy Sayers says in one of her famous essays on work, in nothing has the church so lost her hold on reality as in her failure to understand and respect the secular vocation. She has allowed work and religion to become separate departments and is astonished to find that as a result, the secular work of the world is turned to purely selfish and destructive ends and that the greater part of the world's intelligent workers have become irreligious or at least uninterested in religion. But is it astonishing? How can anyone remain interested in a religion which seems to have no concern with nine tenths of his life? The church's approach to an intelligent carpenter is usually confined to exhorting him not to be drunk and disorderly in his leisure hours and to come to church on Sundays. What the church should be telling him is this, that the very first demand that his religion makes upon him is that he should make good tables. Church, by all means, and decent forms of amusement, certainly. But what use is all that if in the very centre of his life and occupation he is insulting God with bad carpentry? No crooked table legs or ill-fitting drawers ever, I dare swear, came out of the carpenter shops at Nazareth. Nor, if they did, could anyone believe that they were made by the same hand that made heaven and earth. No piety in the worker will compensate for work that is not true to itself. For any work that is untrue to its own technique is a living lie. The best thing for a pilot to do as a Christian in his workplace is to bring the passengers safely to their destination. The way he serves people with this specialised skill, of course alongside the manner in which he does this work with Jesus as his king, bears witness that he lives under the Lordship of Christ. Andy Crouch in his brilliant book, Culture Making, says this about how we need to learn to approach work in our culture. He says, our newly regained cultural awareness means that we are not satisfied, as earlier generations might have been, with separating our faith from worldly activities. We want our lives, our whole lives, to matter for the gospel. But what exactly does that mean? We talk about engaging, impacting, and transforming the culture, when in fact, the people who most carefully study culture tend to stress instead how much we are transformed by it. The worst thing we could do is follow the familiar advice to pray as if it all depended on God and work as if it all depended on you. Rather, we need to become people who work as if it all depends on God, because it does, and because that is the best possible news. We work for, indeed work in, the life and power of a gracious and infinitely resourceful creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Jesus says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. The work of a witness is to become a person whose whole life is lived in utter dependence on God by His Spirit, so that people would come to see God through them. I think that perhaps the most compelling evidence of Jesus' resurrection as recorded in the Scriptures, for us at least who read the stories 2,000 years later and didn't see it with our own eyes, the most compelling evidence could be that most of his closest disciples were killed as a direct result of their claim that Jesus was king. They were killed because they were witnesses. In the book of Revelation, the word witness, which is the word martos in the Greek, has taken on this very meaning. That these people became martyrs for their allegiance to Jesus. They both live and die in a way that shows other people 
who he is. This is what it means to be a witness. The minister in the church that I grew up in, a wise and godly and deeply thoughtful man, took a funeral a few weeks ago. And he said this of the lady who had died. He said, if you are a person who knew Judy, you have in a sense met with her God. For she was an ambassador whose life proclaimed him. What a beautiful thing to have said about you at your funeral. And what a perfect description of what a witness's life does. It enables people to meet with God for themselves. As we cooperate with God, as he forms us into his likeness in the very detail of our work and rest, in the decisions that we make and the words we use and our approach to other people and the way that we do our work, as our lives come more and more under his lordship, our lives bear witness to him, to the world so they may meet him for themselves.